بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ولا يصحب الجنة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الأولين وصل اللهم وصل مبارك على حبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الآخرين اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم كل ما ذكره الذاكر الأبرار وكل ما غفر عن ذكره الغافلون all praise due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى who knows what we reveal and knows what we conceal and even knows what the animals feel. We thank him, we praise him, and on him we have reliance. It is to him we only turn to for true guidance. We ask him to send his peace, his blessings, his mercy on the best of human beings and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on whom be praised until the very end of our days. We ask him for steadfastness, guidance, mercy, and to never lead us astray and for him to save us on Judgment Day. Welcome everybody, alhamdulillah, to our class on the character of Imam Hassan al-Basri and his wisdoms. And this is our 10th uh, session, inshallah, azawajal. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and accept inshallah for uh, having patience with uh, going through the classes inshallah. Okay. So uh, we left off when Imam Hassan al-Basri, uh, his discussions on um, the etiquette of friendship and fellowship. Uh, and we said that uh, he said it is not for manly, uh, manliness or womanliness or dignity uh, to profit as a result of uh, a friend's work. Uh, and he also said, be careful of, of the one who narrates to you what another has said, because they will narrate to others what you say. And then uh, here today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to discuss some things that Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah quotes in this book uh, regarding a person and how they view their deeds. So he said that Imam Hassan al-Basri said, O son of, a- o child of Adam, your deeds are a witness for you, so be wary as to how they reach your Lord. And he used to say, the people who do good are known by these signs. These signs. Number one, Sidqul Hadith, being truthful in speech. Number two, fulfilling promises. Idd al-Amanah. Or Ada'ul Amana. Ada'ul Amana. Number three, Wafa'ul Ahd. Keeping trust when trusted. So keeping trust when, they, when somebody is trusted. Number four, Qil al Fakr wal Khuyala. Simplicity and uh, not showing off and having arrogance. Number five, they are kind to the downtrodden. Rahma ala du'afa. They are kind to those who are weakest. They are kind to those who are weakest. Number six, they have good manners, husn al khuluq. Number seven, they are uh, caring, sa al hilm. They are forbearant and caring. They have a sense of patience with others. They propagate knowledge. Number eight, they propagate knowledge. And number nine, they do not pursue sexual desire. Meaning, illegal sexual desire. Obviously, outside of marriage. Okay, so he says that do not pursue women. Obviously, this is women pursuing men. So they do not pursue uh, and follow up and chase others for, um, you know, obviously for fulfilling their sexual needs. Other than marriage, of course. Other than marriage, of course. And uh, Imam al Jazawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, when he, when he describes this from al Hassan al Basri, every one of these shows you the righteousness of a person internally. Okay, every one of these has, is a sign of righteousness of a person internally. Number one, Sidq al Hadith, is that they're, they're truthful. That Allah loves those who are truthful. Number one. And number two, a sign of truthfulness is a sign of truth, uh, a truthfulness in their heart as well. So it's not just truthfulness in the tongue, but it's truthfulness of the heart. And if somebody who is truthful with, with men can be truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And somebody who can, be truth, who can belie with others, then they can belie with Allah azza wa jal. And similarly the opposite. The one who is truthful with Allah can be truthful with people. And it's a, it's, it's a complementary relationship in that sense. Number two, fulfilling uh, promises. Ada'ul amana. It's self-explanatory, obviously. Among the signs that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, is of the signs of hypocrisy is that when they make a promise or, or they uh, promise to do something, they don't fulfill it. So obviously a believer is a person who fulfills their promises. And wafa bil ahd, they fulfill their trust as well. All three of these 
the opposite of which are signs of hypocrisy. So somebody who's, who, who lies and somebody who does not fulfill their trust and somebody who does not fulfill um, uh, their promises. Whereas all three of them, if you apply them, then it's a sign of a believer. The people who, who do good are known by these signs. So that's why Imam, uh, that's why Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he made a very powerful statement. He said, if you want to know truly somebody, right, uh, you will know them in their, in their etiquette. You will know them in their etiquette. Okay? And um, you will know them in how they deal with others. And he said that uh, a person's prayer does not fool me. A person's prayer does not fool me. But rather, it's how they fulfill their trusts. And that's, that's a very powerful example of how outward religiosity is not necessarily the epitome of, of our faith, but rather how a person is internally. How a person is internally. So... Um, that's incredibly important for us to just kind of reflect on over the statement of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Okay. So... Uh, Ibn Qudama, uh, sorry, Ibn, <laughs> Imam Hassan al-Basri then continues and saying the fourth sign of righteousness is that they have simplicity and they don't have arrogance and pompousness, meaning what? Showing off. They don't have khuyala. Uh, khuyala is a type of showing off with arrogance. So the clothes that you wear, a person wears them for arrogance and showing off. Okay person, you know, it's not just about looking good, it's not just about uh, being good, but it's actually this, they call it swag, right, in, in essence. This swag is not just a swag of looking good or whatever, but it's actually built into it arrogance. And this is something incredibly, um, uh, incredibly uh, detrimental to a person's faith as well as spirituality in the sense that they're trying to show themselves off for the eyes and veneration of people. Whereas the person who dresses nice does it for the veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost. Is that they're doing it under what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible. So this goes into things like clothing, this goes into things uh, such as uh, what you show in terms of your belongings. And that's why some of the salaf, I want you all to just understand, they sometimes would not eat something publicly because they didn't want somebody who was hungry in the street to feel any kind of pain of hunger. Similarly, some of them when they went into certain gatherings where it's not, it's not the custom for you to show off you know, wearing your Louis Vuitton and your Gucci in this gathering, it's not good for you to go and make a person feel like they're, they're, uh, they're in a sense of need. Okay? So you have to do murah of the hal. You have to look at the situation that you're in. If you're going to a place where, alhamdulillah, it's the norm and, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, it's a society which readily accepts people walking in the streets wearing whatever they like, that's fine. But if you're going to a place, let me give you an example. You're going to, um, a, you know, do some kind of charity uh, work. It's not, okay for you to think that you're going to take your Louis Vuitton while you're giving away you know charity this makes absolutely no sense why would you make somebody feel uh, you know worse the fact that they don't have some of the things that you do so this sense of it's called ihsas you have to be, you have to have a sense of empathy and care for others and also staying away from arrogance like look i i can wear this even when i'm doing charity etc so this idea of pompousness goes beyond just what people put 
and display of themselves on social media. You have to be very, very wary. And I'll give you uh, an example. And I'm just saying this, and please take it with a grain of salt because I'm not trying to speak down or anything about anyone or anyone who does this. But just reflect. We know certain uh, teachers, okay, who do not show on their, for example, social media pages, food they eat or places that they go visit. Why? For one reason. Because they have thousands of followers following them. And obviously there's so many of them that can't even afford a vacation. There was one person in particular who is, is a, is a, you know, was a single mother and a, and a teacher. And she said that I haven't been able to afford a vacation for my daughter since she was a baby. And when she went to school, the teacher unknowingly asked the question, what has been your favorite vacation? And her daughter, who's like nine years old, hasn't been to a single vacation her entire life because her mother can't afford it. So it's really, um, it's, 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 it's really a pain that a teacher cannot have that sense of awareness when they're asking that, that kind of question, that this young girl who's nine years old feels now a lot of pain because all of the other kids are telling their stories about what? About their vacations. And this young woman, she, she, this young girl, excuse me, nine years old, she's a young girl. She did, I mean, she's never been on a vacation before because her mother can't afford it. So the, the t- it's, it's behooving of the teacher to know their privilege. And it's behooving of us to know our privileges. And that's why the teacher that, that I'm speaking to you about would not put on their stories and their timelines uh, food that they eat or places that they visit. Why? Because not to make one of their followers feel bad in their heart. And this level of awareness is extremely important. Because we need to check our privilege sometimes when we share certain things. And I'm not saying this to you, by the way, like as a, as a, as a form of you know, degradation or looking down on anyone who does this, by the way, at all. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. But a person who's in a position of leadership is not like a person who's just re- normal, regular. People in position of leadership have a higher standard of expectation in spirituality. And we spoke about this with Hassan al-Basri and that, remember that spiritual man that came in and basically scoffed at the idea of eating sweets? Hassan al-Basri ate it to show that, listen, people who are in the spiritual level are not going to be more uh, are perceived as arrogant and not eating sweets to other people because of what? Uh, de- detaching from the dunya and things like that. He's like, no, this is nothing. He's like, instead of detaching from this, detach from the haram. Detached from the things that are, that are, that are in your private state. So I'm, I'm saying this to you to give you a sense of reality. That you have to be aware. Be constantly aware of where you are and what you're doing. Don't make somebody feel that you're completely oblivious of your, of your privilege. And the wealth that you have. And the things that, you, that, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with. It's very important. And this is part of khuyala, people walking around, they don't, they're completely oblivious that they're, they're privileged people, they're privileged individuals. And that's why some people are so oblivious, they make statements like, I can't believe people would do this. Right? And they don't know that people work two jobs and three jobs even. I know people like that. So it's, it's, this was a characteristic of Rasulullah wasallam. He would never walk entitled. And that's the same thing that we should do. Never walk pompously. With khuyala. Okay? And then he says, maintaining ties of kinship. So we have number one, truthfulness in speech. And number two, fulfilling promises. Adawul amana. And then uh, keeping trust. And um, simplicity and eschewing pompousness. And number five, maintaining ties of kinship. So a lot of people, they say, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so, you're not that busy. And I'm saying this to myself. You know, there's so many times we often make uh, excuses. I can't call my... I can't call my uncle, I can't call my aunt, I can't call my grandma, I can't call... No, you're making excuses. Yes, you can. You have perfect amount of time to do so. So making that excuse is not a valid thing in Islam. You should maintain that ties of kinship. If not, only for the pure... Making your, your family member feel like you actually care about them. You're genuine and you're making a call and asking about them. But it's beloving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. And number three... The Prophet ﷺ said, among the ways that Allah blesses you to have a longer life is 
that you maintain ties of kinship. This is among the ways that Allah grants you long life. So it's a reminder for myself and everyone that if you want these three blessings, the pleasure of Allah, of course, first and foremost. Secondly, to make another person happy. And number three is that it would actually extend your life. People think about like aging creams and all this other stuff. You know, like what pill do I need to take? Just maintain ties with your family. Allah said it will bless you in your wealth. Allah will bless you, excuse me, in, your, in, your, in your, the length of your life. Maintaining ties uh, with your family, Allah will bless you in your life and extend your life. How? This is a matter of the unseen. Don't ask me, I don't know the formula so I can put it in a cream for you, right? This is just in the, in the knowledge of Allah. And then uh, the, the Prophet, uh, excuse me, Al Hassan al Basri said uh, number six. Is that number six? One, two, three, four, five. Number six, to, ha- to be kind to the weak. Rahma ala du'afa. To have kindness towards the weak. Not to be ambivalent. Not to o- look over them. Not to think that, hey, what, you know, uh, why are you bothering me? Or being annoyed. Okay? That's incredibly important. You should not be ambivalent to someone that's in need. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded this by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَعُهَا أَذَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah that a good word is better than, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, better than, were you to give charity and then after that you, you have like annoying words. Ada. Why? Because it's better for you to just say good words. Somebody comes up to you and say, hey, hey man, can you give me some money, an extra change? You say, God bless you, man. I'm sorry, man. I don't, ha- I-, I don't have anything with me. Or just say, God bless you. May Allah bless you. That's it. It's better for you to smile in the face of somebody than look at them like, what are you doing? Astaghfirullah. Have bad intentions of people. You don't know their situation. You don't know what caused them to, to, to come to this, uh, to this situation. You don't know what forced them. You don't know that the system is based around you know, people who have, who have made a mistake in their life. And they've gone to prison. That's forever on their on their uh, on their record. In Islam, we don't have that. We don't have to have this thing of forever on your record, and you can't work and you can't do anything. What what kind of system is that? There's no dignity afforded to human beings. Okay. So in that sense, you don't know what what the story is behind somebody. You you need to empathize with them at the very least. If you can't give, meaning give some food, give something. And if you can't even do that, and you don't want to give money, just give a good word. The Prophet uh, was commanded this by Allah. قول معروف is better to say a good word is better than to look ambivalently at people especially people who are homeless or people who are in need be very very careful about that so have rahma al meaning what what does rahma al du'afa mean to have uh, mercy on those who are weak among the having mercy over those who are weak is empathizing with them meaning what you always consider the situation that a person is in you always think, what is it like to walk in their shoes? This is called rahmah. Okay? So this is incredibly important to at least think of yourself what it would be like if you were in their shoes. This is called rahmah al Number seven, they have good manners. Husn al This is a sign again of people who are good. They are known by these signs. Number seven, they have good manners. Husn al It doesn't take much. Have good manners. Number eight, they're caring, sa'al hilm. And hilm is forbearance in the sense of uh, you know, not losing one's call. And may, may Allah help us all with that, right? Having a sense of caring. Number eight, they propagate knowledge. They give knowledge to whoever. Somebody is going through a bad, bad uh, situation in their life. Give them the dua of overcoming what? Overcoming worry. Allahumma ya'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Or huzun. Oh Allah, I, I seek refuge in you from grief and anxiety. Give them this dua. Say, read this dua. Read Ayat al-Kursi. Recite at, uh, Surah Al-Mulk before you go to, uh, go to bed. Pray two raka'ah. Raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're what? They're people who always give good to others. Knowledge. When a person's in need, they're always there. Someone's going through a difficult situation, you tell them something from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that you heard from one of your teachers. You direct them to teachers if they need a specific answer. Bath al-ilm, they love to spread knowledge. Okay? And that does not mean they love to give fatwa. That's what people do right now. They're, we call them milkshakes, right? Everyone has a YouTube channel, everybody's, 
has an opinion on social media. I think, and I think, and you think, and we all think, right? That's not what Bath al ilm is. Knowledge is not focused on you giving your opinions on fatwa, and you haven't studied fatwa. I don't care if you have a PhD or engineering or whatever you do. If a person has not studied, then they should not give fatwa. They should direct them to those who have fatwa. Now, does that mean that you can't speak about Islam? Of course not. Those things that are clear in Islam, those things that uh, uh, re- reflect on the, the meaning of the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi that you've studied with a teacher, that you've learned, of course, teach that to others. Of course. But don't sit there and give fatwa. And I think you know you should do this. Your salah is valid or invalid. This is not your, your Go Give them to a teacher. They need to learn and study fiqh. And if you can help them to get an answer, say, you know what, I'll get an answer for you. Let me ask a teacher. That's even great. But bath al-ilm means, as Ibn Abbas says, to teach people the foundational aspects of Islam before you teach them what? The secondary. Teach them the foundational. People don't know basic things now. And you're so focused, we're all so focused about arguing about these complexes. Right? Bath al-ilm, they spread knowledge. Hey, let me tell you about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Let me tell you about the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Let me tell you a story from seerah. Let me tell you what happened in the Qur'an with, with uh, those who are the, um, uh, the surah called Surah Al-Kahf. You know, if you read Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you light, meaning clarity in your life from one, week, from one day till the following week. The entire week you'll have light. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua of those who uh, stand in the, in the last portion of the night or any portion of the night and they raise their hands. You know what? This is called Bath al-ilm. Get people to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can share them with them the hadith. The Prophet said, whoever says the, the dua, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani, the, the famous dua, Sayyid al-Istighfar, Allah will forgive them. Give them hope. Or if you say, whoever says subhanallah wa bihamdihi 100 times a day, it takes two minutes, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins even if they were like as much as the foam in ocean. What does that do? You're giving hope to people. This is called Bath al Not sit there and convolute Islam Make it so different and, 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 and uh, difficult for people. That's not what Bath al-ilm is. You start talking about the mind, you say, here, let me tell you about 8 raka'ahs versus 20 raka'ahs. Let me tell you what the fatwa on this is. Let me tell you, this is not, stay away from that stuff. Spread knowledge. Stay away from these convoluted complexes and disagreements. Okay, and lastly, number 9, they do not, the, the literal wording is they do not pursue women. What does that mean? They do not chase the opposite gender. They do not chase the opposite gender. Okay? And wanting what? To fulfill sexual desire. That's all they do. So a person who is not busy in doing that is a sign of good. They don't pursue chasing the opposite gender for their attention, their affection, their acknowledgement. For what reason? They, if, they're, if they're married, of course, the difference is if you chase your wife and your, your husband all day you want, no problem. But they don't pursue women, they don't pursue men. It's a sign of, it's a sign of uh, goodness in a person. Why does he mention this as well? Because listen, a person can, go, uh, can be affected by diseases of the heart in two ways. One of them is doubts, when a person does not have their questions answered. And another one is uh, shahawat. The first one is shubuhat, which is doubts. And the second of which is shahawat, which is desires. So a person can be led astray by their desires. And that's why when a person commits sin of desire, it places darkness on their heart. As the Prophet ﷺ says, when you commit a sin, a black dot is placed on your heart. So when there's so much black and a person does not repent, the Prophet ﷺ says when a person asks for forgiveness or repents, it's, it's removed. It's removed from their, from their, uh, from their uh, heart, inshallah. Okay. Whereas a person who perpetually commits sins, the entirety of the heart becomes black. Imam Hassan al-Basri said, Also, O child of Adam, refrain from the prohibitions of Allah by being a true servant. And be grateful for the provisions that that has been given to you. Only then shall you be rich. Be good to your neighbor and love for the people which you love for yourself. Only then you shall be just. Reduce your laughter for it kills the heart just like the body dies. So he says, look, if you want to be rich and if you want to be just 
and if you want to maintain a, a, a heart that's alive. These are the three solutions. Number one, refrain from the prohibitions of Allah. Be grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Then you will be rich. Stay away from prohibitions and be grateful to what Allah has given you. And that being grateful to what Allah has given you in so many different ways. Be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what He has given you in your body. How many people have like negative self-image? They're not content with what they look like or what Allah has blessed them with. So they want to physically change their bodies because they don't have that sense of self-contentment. Okay? Number two is a type of being grateful for what Allah has given you is the spouse. How many people are not content with their spouses? Astaghfirullah. And they're like chasing, oh, this fantasy land romance, which is not real. Rather than working on what they have and, 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 and being grateful for what Allah has given them. Right? I'm talking about, you know, regardless of people's marriage problems, all that. I'm talking about the normative, alhamdulillah, Allah blessed you with the spouse. Another form of being grateful for what Allah has given you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with a certain level of, of wealth. That does not mean don't invest, that does not mean don't uh, pursue business. I'm saying that the wealth that you have right now, you should be grateful for it. And when you have that sense of contentment, that is true enrichment. Rather than being somebody who lives constantly with envy in their heart and wishing what is in someone else's hand. What kind of contentment would they have? They don't. They scroll through social media feeds, wanting what's, oh, I wish I had that, I wish I had that, I wish I had her, her hands, I wish I had his, his arms, I wish I had her eyes, I wish I had his, his, his mouth, I wish I had her hair. I wish I, this is constantly in their mind. How, how are you content in life? For a person to have this kind of, in the, uh, this kind of spiritual state. So to work on that is to start being grateful. To start being grateful, to stay away from that which is forbidden. He says you will become rich. Be good to your neighbor and love for people what you love for yourself. You will be then just. Be good to your neighbor. This is not only just the neighbor. This is everyone that's near you. Love for them what you want, what which you would love for yourself. Then you will be considered just. It's very powerful. Because if you consider, the, the, the word here is consideration. Be considerate. Consider other people. When you consider others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will consider you. And hence, when you love for what, what, uh, what, you, what you love for yourself and what you love for them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you of, among those who are just on this world. But if you don't, and you constantly seek your own selfish, utilitarian mo morality, which is basically for my benefit and my benefit only, then what happens? You're all out in it for yourself, I'm in it for myself, they're in it for themselves, everybody's in it for themselves, nafsi nafsi, until the day of judgment. Whereas the Islamic society, the socialist understanding is, is, is not even close to the level of Islam. Islam considers everyone around them. And the more you're considered of other people, when you think you're on a bus and there's a lady that comes in, get up, let her sit. Or there's an old lady that needs help with something, you help her. There's an elderly person. There's a person that can't afford something. There's a neighbor that's in need. You check up on your, uh, on your, on your friends. All forms of consideration. And you love for people what you love for yourself. Only then you will be a just person. And then he says at the end, reduce your laughter for it kills the heart. And by the way, this doesn't mean don't be a happy person. Don't enjoy... There's people we love enjoying laughing. But the, he the, the point being here is exaggerative. Where every single day... You must go through a, 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 a fit of laughter. Or you watch things that you must make you laugh all day. Or you sit in a gathering the entire time all you're doing is laughing. There's nothing that's mentioned of benefit. So we have to check ourselves. That's why it's left general. Too much laughter kills the heart. Right? And why? Because a person that's so in engaged with play and folly, what does that make them become? Heedless. It makes them become heedless. Heedless of the reality of this world, and heedless of the reality of the hereafter. So that's why it's, it's okay to laugh. The Prophet ﷺ has mentioned that when his, his companions would laugh, he would laugh with them. 
He was known that he would share with their jokes and he would share in their sorrow. This was the description of Rasulullah But it has a time and a place. There's some people their entire life is a joke. And that's why people even make fun of them. Because their joke does not stop. Everything must be sarcastic. That's a person that needs to grow up. That's a person that needs to take sarcasm out of their life. Not everything is sarcastic. Just grow up. Be mature. There's a time for sarcasm and there's a time there's not. Some people, and I'll tell you this, this is a, this is a bad habit in social media. It's a bad habit in social media. When somebody's posting something that's serious, and then you have these individuals that all the time they crack jokes about something that's a serious thing. Stop doing that. That's, not, that's inappropriate. Okay? So the idea is uh, making everything out to be a joke and not knowing the time and place for it is problematic in our faith, spiritually. Right? It's okay to laugh. It's okay to, it, it's okay to enjoy life. The Prophet ﷺ was known as the one who smiled the most in his life, meaning he enjoyed. And the Prophet ﷺ even said that it's been made beloved to me in this dunya. Right? But at the same time, what did he say? I love, I love perfume, I love cologne, I love, I love my wife. The Prophet ﷺ would mention, right? But all of that compared to the hereafter does not even equal the wing of a fly. Janah ba'uda. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ is constantly aware of the everlasting blessing of the hereafter and not allowing it delude him from the pleasures of this of this life the pleasures of this life so those these things are again to be to to avoid the prohibitions of allah by being a true servant to be grateful for the uh, provision so avoid prohibition be grateful for, for, for the provision that has been portioned for you you will become rich if you do these things you, be, you will be known as rich if you're good to your neighbor and you love for people what you love for yourself you will be just. And the last thing is, reduce your laughter because it kills your heart, just like the body dies. Your heart dies just like the body dies. These are the three things, and the first two have two sections. Okay, inshallah? He also said, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah said, O people, you will not attain that which you love until you refrain from that which you desire. Subhanallah. You will not attain what you love until you refrain from what you desire. You will not attain that which you hope for except with patience on that which you dislike or you hate. Two sentences, listen to it carefully. You will not attain what you love until you refrain from what you desire. Meaning what? Let's say a, a, a guy and a girl love one another. What is something that they desire? They want to be intimate together. This is natural. But you will not attain the blessing of this matrimony if you do it in haram. You will attain the blessing of this matrimony if you do it in halal. So, if you want to attain that which you love, refrain from that which is you desire. Okay? Certain things we desire. I, I desire sleep. I don't, I don't want to go, I don't want to wake up early in the morning. But if you want to attain that which you love, which is Jannah, you have to refrain from that which you desire, which is sleep. And you will not, the second sentence, you will not attain that which you hope for, except with patience. How many people want to learn Arabic? Tons of people. So I tell, we tell our students this. If you want to learn Arabic, you will not attain that which you hoped for. Except with patience on that which you hate. And what do you hate? Studying every day, making vocabulary lists, doing your surf charts, your conjugations. I hate those things. But you know what? That made me learn the Arabic language. So you will not attain that which what you hope for, except with patience with that which you hate. You will not attain that which you hope, except with patience with that which you hate. I hate going to work every single day. But you have to work in order to make that investment money. I hate to do you know, something regularly, but you have to have patience in doing it so that you can attain what you want. Beautiful two lines. Beautiful two lines of wisdom by Imam Hassan al-Basri. He also said, 
Patience is a treasure from among the treasures of paradise. Patience is a treasure from the treasures of paradise. And a, a person attains all goodness when they observe patience at the right time. Why is it a treasure from the treasures of paradise? Because if you're patient, then Allah will bless you with something that you couldn't even reach by doing an action. And if you're, not, if you're not patient, you will lose out on the reward even if you did the action. What does that mean? If a person wants something, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is forbidden for you, and a person doesn't have patience and they actually do it, right? They can ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive. But if they have patience, the reward that they will get will be more than if they actually went and attained it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow for them to have this forbidden thing. So they have patience in the things that Allah forbade. Another form of patience, that's number one patience. Number two is patience on the things that Allah commanded. Salah is hard. Salah is not easy. But you have patience on doing the thing that Allah commanded and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward me greatly exponentially that I believe in. And that's why I have patience on the Allah's commandments. That's the second type of patience. And number three type of patience is patience on what Allah decreed. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. My prayer, my sacrifices, my life and my death are for Allah, the Lord of the world. So when something happens in your life, you surrender and you say, Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'oon. Hasbun Allah wa ni'ma l-ukeel. La hawla wa la quwta illa billah. Qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. And you have patience bearing this because it's the decree of Allah. Whether it's the loss of life. نَقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ فَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if, you, if uh, the believers are those who if they have loss of wealth or loss of uh, provision and, and harvest uh, or loss of life, what do they say? They say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong and to Him we return. Meaning what? They're patient. Because it's the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبَشِّرِ what? الصَّابِرِينَ فَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ So give good news to those who are patient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah rewards the patient بِغَيْرِ hisab Without an account. Without, without an account. How much Allah gives is exponential for the ones who are patient. And that's why Imam Ibn al-Qayyim wrote an entire book called Uddah to Sabirin. Right? What has been prepared for those who are patient. SubhanAllah. An entire book on just the reward of those who are patient. And that's why he said, Imam Hassan al-Basri said, patience is a treasure from among the treasures of paradise. So a person will attain all goodness when they observe patience at the right time. These are the three times. Patience on the command of Allah, patience on staying away with what Allah forbade, and patience in the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's sub-patiences, like patience with a teacher, patience with your family, patience with your parents, patience with your children, patience with your spouse, patience with your friends, and so on and so forth. And he also used to say, whoever has been conferred with contentment, whoever has been given contentment, rida, will be satisfied with their rizq, with their provision. So when you're content, then you're content and satisfied with what Allah has given you in your rizq. And he who is satisfied with their rizq is patient when afflicted with a calamity. So this is the formula. If you've been given contentment, you'll be satisfied with your rizq. And if you're satisfied with your rizq, you will be patient when afflicted with a calamity. This is the correlation. So number one, be content. That will lead you to satisfaction with what has been portioned for you. And if you're satisfied with what Allah has given you, then you will be patient and you will be granted patience with calamity. SubhanAllah. The correlation between contentment and being able to bear calamities. Or it's a direct uh, complementary relationship. It was said that a man was cursing another in the presence of Al Hasan. The man who was cursed stood up, wiping sweat off of his face, and then he recited the following. So uh, the following ayah 
وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ And whoever is patient and forgives, indeed that is from one of the matters that requires determination. So Al-Hasan was amazed and he said, his response encompassed determination and he received this reward while this ignorant one lost it. While this ignorant one lost it. The ignorant one didn't have patience not to curse him. And the one being cursed stood firmly. So he got this reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever is patient and forgives, they are the matter, they are the ones who will receive determination. إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Indeed, that is of matters that require determination. So he said, this person's response encompassed determination, while that ignorant lost it. And that's why there's a statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says that, pay, that indeed learning, excuse me, indeed becoming knowledgeable is through learning. And indeed becoming patient is through exercising patience. How do you get patience? You have to exercise it. It's not going to be handed to you in a platter. Here you go, three pounds of patience please, $2.99. It doesn't work that way. You have to practice it. And when do you practice it? You're going to fail a few times with your friends, with your with your spouses, with your families. But then you have to practice it. You have to force yourself. And that's why our teacher, Shaykh Abdullah Shankhiti, he said, listen, Islam's spirituality only has two solutions. Are you ready? And we're going to end with this, inshallah. Islam's spirituality is two. Number one, either you have mukabada. Mukabada, meaning what? You strive against yourself. That's the solution of Islam spirituality. Islam spirituality tries to wake you and me up. And when we're woken, we have to strive against ourselves. If you're impatient, you have to force yourself to become patient. If you're somebody who's envious, you have to force yourself to become not envious. If you're somebody who's pompous and, and, and knows they look good and they need to show off, you have to force yourself to push, push that ego down. You're somebody who is belligerent, you have to fight that off. You're somebody who has a tongue that constantly curses, you have to fight that off. You're somebody who's constantly uh, late or breaks promises, you have to fight that off. Mukabada, meaning struggling against yourself. That's the first solution. The second solution is mukabara. And it's not a solution. The second solution is either you're going to struggle, uh, which is the first, against yourself, or the second is arrogance in rejecting it. Like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good, I don't need it. Denial, I don't, I'm good, I'm patient, I don't need this. Islam accepts either one of the uh, two. Either a person will be someone who struggles or a person will be someone who's arrogant and rejects. And the second one is the one who is rejected. If they reject the spirituality and the formula, they will then be rejected by Allah Azza wa Jal. Very simple in that, in, in that essence. And that's why we end with this. Imam Hassan al-Basri said, O child of Adam, be patient or be destroyed. Be patient or be destroyed. Meaning what? A person who's not patient, doesn't understand patience in the levels that we discussed, what will happen to them? They will actually eat themselves. A person who's not patient with the decree of Allah, what do you think, how do, what do you think they, 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 they deal with? And we're not talking about uh, uh, psychological, medical anxiety, but they, have, they suffer from a sense of anxiety and depression. لا يعلمه إلا الله why? Because they don't, they don't believe in the guarantee that Allah gives. If Allah guarantees and gives decree, and His decree is final, then, they, then a believer finds contentment and solace. Whereas someone who does not have this, they don't have patience in the decree of Allah, they will constantly question. They will never have tranquility in their heart. And that's why He says, be patient or be destroyed. If you don't have patience, it will destroy you. Either destroy your relationships, destroy your, your relationship with Allah or with others, or it will eat you inside until it destroys your, your mind. And what will give a human being a, a sanity and solace and comfort? When they have patience in knowing that Allah is the one that rewards for patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are the ones that reward and give and grant for those who show patience without an account. بغير حساب. بغير حساب. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are patient and to fulfill the nine characteristics of those who are signs of people who have good and rectified hearts. The two aspects of understanding, or sorry, the three aspects of understanding uh, how to be a person who is rich and a person who is just and have a live heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those who fulfill what we want and have hope in. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill and uh, allowing us to stay away from those things that we are fearful of, the two things that he mentioned. And lastly, all encompassing in that, for, for us to be granted the treasure of the treasures of paradise, which is patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are patient, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Patience in obedience of Allah, patience in, 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 in staying away from that which he forbade, and patience in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and patience with each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless you all. Jazakum al-khair wa salli 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 Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala'in. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be having our class in um, Principles of Spirituality by Shaykh Aisha al-Ba'uni rahimahullahu ta'ala. We're on the second uh, principle, which is sincerity. The first principle was tawbah. And inshallah, we will all see you tomorrow. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salli 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 sal